my name is Amanda Carling. My job here is manager of Indigenous Initiatives. I also graduated from this law school um, as recently as 2012. Um, I practiced law for a couple years and then I came back in my current role. This is my fourth year, so I am really grateful to be here. Um, I am going to introduce Jeff, but I wanted to start by acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates. Um, for thousands of years, in fact, we know at least 15,000 years, there have been many groups of Indigenous people who have called this land their home, and that includes the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, um, so groups that are Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, so lots of different languages were spoken on this land, lots of different things happened on this land, and uh, when we think about that really long history, um, the amount of time that Canada has been around, like just over 150 years, is kind of just a blip on the radar, which I think it's good to have that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to say um, is something that I'm going to apologize to Erica for, because Erica heard me say this last week when we welcomed a bunch of outsiders, but it's the first time I'm having an opportunity to say it to all of you as members of our community. Um, has everyone seen the large, beautiful painting that we have in the atrium? And some of you might know where I'm going with this. So um, in 2016, because we know as a community, you know, you've probably all heard the land acknowledgement at some point this month. If not this month, you've heard it since you started school. You, if you're first year, you've heard me say it at the beginning of the school year. And we know that land acknowledgements can start to sound like they're like routine or trite or part of our kind of housekeeping duties. Like, oh yeah, this is uh, Anishinaabe land, and by the way, the bathroom is over there, and turn your cell phone off, right? Like, we don't want this to be a housekeeping matter. So in 2016, um, the then members of the Indigenous Law Students Association came up with this idea of creating a visual representation of our gratitude for existing on this specific land where the law school is. And we wanted to have that visual representation be painted by a local Indigenous artist. And they came up with the idea of um, the painting representing a meeting place for all of our relations. And they looked at a bunch of different artists that they considered you know, they would love to have a painting by that artist in the school, and the artist that we landed on was um, a man named J. Bell Redford. And when we first selected J. Bell Redford, we had no idea what an impression he was going to have on the Faculty of Law. Um, I don't think we initially expected that he was going to paint it here, but very quickly he was like, oh yeah, I can do that, and also I need a space, and we were like, Okay, <laughs> and I think when I went to, I can't remember when I went to Alexis, who I report to, and I said, can we turn one of those meeting rooms into a studio for a month or so? I thought maybe I would get a little bit of pushback, but um, absolutely I did not. And for almost two months, J. Bell Redford had kind of a studio space in our school over the summer. And it was really neat because community members were coming in and out of the space and um, you know, young artists were coming to Jay to show him things that they have painted and that they were really proud of because he had that significant position of respect um, and he garnered a lot of admiration from young people in our community, um, both because he's an incredible artist, but also if you met him, you would know he's really, really funny. Um, so it was an absolute pleasure to have him here. We did an event where we unveiled the painting, so if you're interested in learning more about this story, you can actually watch on the Indigenous Initiatives Office uh, YouTube channel. We have we reported um, both Jay talking about that painting, but also Elderly Miracle talking about um, the meaning of land and, and uh, different things related to that. Um, and when Jay decided what he was going to paint for us, he created three sketches. And the Indigenous law students and, and myself, we looked at the three sketches and we said, we love all of them, how can we pick? And we said, we're gonna start with this one and eventually we're gonna invite Jay back when we find money and we're gonna have him paint the other two. Um, and unfortunately, Jay passed away this year. So um, he is not going to be able to paint those last two paintings for us, but we are eternally grateful that he gets to be part of our land acknowledgement and part of our community in this so I wanted to start by saying that and just um, giving space to acknowledge Jay, Jay and his contribution. Um, okay, so that, that's enough. That's enough about us. <laughs> we're going uh, to introduce our, our guest today. Um, Jeff is a, a lawyer with Blake's. He is responsible for a number of the firm's diversity initiatives, including several of which are designed to attract students from diversity. 
backgrounds into the practice of law in a business law firm. But he's more than that. He's more interesting than just that. Um, prior to joining Blake's, Jeff practiced as a, as a litigator and served as a public policy advisor in the area of Métis rights and self-government. Jeff is a Métis citizen and a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, and he frequently presents on a variety of topics in the area of Aboriginal law, both internally at Blake and as a guest uh, lecturer at law schools. So this, I hope, is not the last time you have an opportunity to learn from, J from Jeff. Um, he also worked with Terry Abrams on the management of the Blake Student Program, including the recruitment, supervision, and professional development of the summer and Earthling students, and he liaises with law schools, which is how we met. Yeah. So Jeff had originally reached out to me while I was on maternity leave, and I said, you know, I'm not around now, but I'm going to be coming back soon. And the first day that he came to meet me, we were so busy chatting, I think our meeting was at 2 o'clock, and I have to leave at 4 o'clock now to pick my baby up from daycare, and this is a really difficult adjustment for me to get used to leaving on time. And it was getting closer and closer and closer to four o'clock and I couldn't get my dad to pick the baby up. So I finally, I looked up and I said to Jeff, you know, I'm really blurry. And then it got a little awkward. I was like, I feel like this is going really well. <laughs> and I really want to be it's friends true. with you and work with yeah. you. And it was like kind of like, a, like an awkward date moment. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, but you need to leave now. <laughs> you have to go. <laughs> because I have yeah. to go. Um, so, you know, I, I wrote it in your little thank you card. I really do honestly hope that this is the first of many Absolutely. opportunities that we have to work together, unless you're awful. If yeah. You case, like, <laughs> we'll see what the room thinks at the end of it. If I'm like, well, that was great. Yeah. So see you when I see you. Honestly, please help me welcome Jeff. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, so first off, I want to I want to send my sincere thanks to Amanda. That was really that was very very kind, um, and the Indigenous Initiatives Office here at the U of T Faculty of Law for allowing me to uh, to present to all of you today. Um, and I also wanted to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm not so far removed from my own law school experience, 2012 as well, same as Amanda. Um, and I know your schedules are packed. Everybody here is busy. Everybody has obligations. So I consider it uh, uh, quite an honor and a privilege to get to speak with you. So thank you for taking the time out of your day. Um, I do see some familiar faces in the room, which is really, uh, which is really great to hear. But um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I think Amanda sort of summarized things quite well, so I don't need to give you a, a, a ton of detail. Um, but, uh, but as Amanda mentioned, I now work at the law firm of, uh, of Blake Castles and Graydon. Um, and today, you know, I'm, I'm kind of purely here on my own, not really hearing on uh, behalf of the firm. But um, I do want to talk just a little bit about what my role looks like at the firm and how I think it's informed uh, part of the reason why I'm here speaking with you today. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, in my role at Blake's, I lead a number of the firm's diversity uh, and inclusion in initiatives. And um, in addition to managing our student program, my responsibility also includes um, developing and facilitating education program for our summer and for our articling students. And it's that final role that I think has kind of led me to being here and in front of you all today. Um, I work in a very sort of interesting position in my job. You know, I do student programming, but I've got a background in some teaching. Um, and I view a lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day job with our students as building a curriculum that will help supplement their law school experience. Um, that's kind of a responsibility I've taken on myself. Um, and sometimes that'll look more substantive in nature. You know, you hear about things like legal writing seminars and all that kind of good stuff. But sometimes it touches on other skills, cultural competency, unconscious bias training. Um, and given my background and knowledge in the area of Aboriginal law, my life experience as a Métis, um, I've been able to introduce topics uh, internally at the firm um, that you know, are relevant to cultural competency. So sharing my own culture, my own history, my family's story. Um, but then it gets into more substantive legal subjects like the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and I'm able to sort of formulate that into what we cover with our own students, um, which is fantastic. Because I think it's a building block on what all of us uh, will recognize is an, important, uh, an increasingly important part of your legal education as law students, is learning about subjects like this. Um, so I do consider it quite an honor and a privilege to be able to contribute in um, some small way to your legal education as law students. And as I said, I think it sort of blends nicely with what I try to do with my day-to-day -day job as well. Um, so in terms of what I want to actually get into and cover with you today, because um, I know we are, uh, you know, our time is somewhat limited, um, I think this can really be streamlined and simplified into, um, into sort of three things that I want to cover with you. And the session that um, I'm presenting is entitled, What the Future Generation of Lawyers Needs to Know About on DRIP. And I know that there are some members of the audience here today who may not necessarily be 
law students, you might be lawyers yourself, you might be just members of the public. Um, and if you're not a lawyer, first off, congratulations. <laughs> you made excellent life choices. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I kid, but I, I think a lot of this just needs to be known in general. It's part of our sort of our broader responsibility as Canadians in this ongoing conversation around reconciliation. So while a lot of my comments will be focused on, oh, this is why I think future lawyers will want to know this, or law students should be mindful of this, um, take to heart that I think everything in this presentation will give you some sense of value, and I think you're part of an important conversation and a dialogue that's ongoing about reconciliation. Um, but in terms of what I want to talk about, I really want to just cover three things with you today, and they seem very, very simple, um, and I hope they come across that way. Um, the first is, so what is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People? So first and foremost, I'm just going to provide you with an admittedly very rushed breakdown um, of the history of the UN Declaration, including its history of its treatment by the Government of Canada. And secondly, I want to highlight what you need to know about the UN Declaration, paying particular attention to some of the reasons uh, why lawyers, um, regardless of what your anticipated practice area might be, um, want to know what's in the Declaration. You're going to want to know it. Um, and lastly, I'm going to provide just a very brief discussion of what I sort of, uh, my sense of what the future of the Declaration might be um, in Canadian law. And there's been some really interesting developments just in the last three days that I'm going to highlight for you. So that part of my presentation changed a lot at 11 o'clock last night um, <laughs> because of some interesting developments that have come up this week. So it's an exciting time. Um, but before I get into a background and an overview of what the Declaration's all about, I want to just touch briefly, <coughs> jump out of order and preview for you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about with uh, the second part of my remarks. And it's a little bit about why I think an awareness of this um, Declaration is so important. And there are some broader, I'll call them principled reasons, why all Canadians should know what's in this Declaration. And I'm going to speak about that in, in some detail later. Um, but, you know, the way I always phrase, uh, kind of frame this when I'm speaking with, with lawyers or my fellow colleagues or law students that I've, you know, I've spoken to about this um, is, frankly, I think it's in your own self-interest to know what's in here. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation and dialogue that occurred over the most recent election and within the last two or three years and in the aftermath of the TRC <coughs> calls to action. Um, uh, but this conversation about implementing the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And this process of implementation um, opens up the very real possibility of a number of legal reforms, which I think are going to impact a number or have the potential to impact a number of different practice areas. Um, and the Government of Canada has stated quite publicly um, and, uh, and adamantly that the government is going to fulfill its commitment to implementing UNDRIP through an ongoing review of its laws, its current policies, you know, administrative matters, everything. Um, that's their stated position. Um, and these laws and policies that they're, you know, they're committing to reviewing are uh, going to be wide-ranging in terms of their scope. So what I hope to demonstrate when we get to the second part of my presentation today is that, you know, regardless of what you anticipate you might want to do in the future as a, as a future legal professional, um, you know, whether you want to work in something as broad-ranging as uh, you know, corporate financing, or if you want to work in the resource sector, or if you want to work in intellectual property, um, whether you're going to represent, you know, you would like to represent indigenous communities or whether or not you'd like to represent members of industry. Regardless of what your future goals might be or your future anticipated practices might look like or hope to look like, um, I'm going to try to make the case that UN the implementation of the UN Declaration um, will touch on many more practice areas than you might think of at first glance. Um, and I think knowing this will help prepare you for your future. Um, I really, I really, really do believe that. Um, a lot of the time being an effective lawyer, no matter who your client is or who you're trying to represent, um, involves being able to anticipate where things are headed. Um, I think you set yourself up for success and allow yourself to be ahead of the curve if you know what's coming in the future and you know what that might look like, or at least have a sense of what that might look like. And what I'm going to try to make the case today is that a knowledge of this UN Declaration is about preparing yourself for practice in the future. And, and I got to tell you, time and time again, I'll just have casual conversations with, I mean, lawyers at Blake's, but, you know, my fellow colleagues and people around my year of call, because, you know, I love to talk about this sort of stuff, because I'm great at parties. <laughs> and, and when, you know, I bring this up to them, and, and if, if I turn it around on them and I say, like, oh, you work in this area. Well, have you thought about X, Y, and Z, which is actually in the declaration? Do you think you'll ever work for clients where they might intersect with the interests of indigenous communities? And if the answer is yes, their, their eyes kind of get wide when I start taking them through the articles in the declaration 
just how broad they are in scope and how many different areas of what you'd consider sort of the broader legal landscape and the broader sort of cultural life of Canada these articles actually deal with. So I, I, my hope is that you'll leave with sort of a similar sense of, um, I guess, wow. <laughs> 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 um, but I won't, I won't try to oversell it. So, so to start, um, what is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People? And I never like to assume that everyone will come in with a certain base level knowledge of what the declaration is, but because I know that there's a number of people here who are quite involved with the IIO here at U of T, and maybe you're just, you've got a particular passion and interest about the declaration itself, or you followed it closely, or maybe you followed it not so closely, but I'll throw it open to the audience. Can anybody just give me a, a Coles Notes version about what, people call it UNDRIP, people in indigenous communities don't typically call it UNDRIP, but a lot of lawyers call it UNDRIP, but the UN declaration, what it actually is. Anybody? I will, I will tell you too if nobody wants. Yeah, right here, perfect. I would assume that it's similar to the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child. Mm. But it's obviously within the framework of indigenous, uh, protecting the rights of indigenous peoples yeah. across the world. Right. I think you certainly touched on it. Anybody else have anything they want to add? I'll take you through it too. Yeah, right here. Anybody else up front? I saw a few hands up front. Right. So a rec for those who couldn't hear, a recognition of historical injustice is a framework for reconciliation. That's certainly a lot of the, the language that I think has been used in the dialogue about it. And right here. <laughs> saw a hand right here. <laughs> Right. Um, I think you've all sort of touched on something that uh, I, I think is particularly striking when you actually sit down and read this declaration. I've brought copies. I'm going to leave them at the front because I actually want everyone in this room to read this document. It's not like you've got coursework to do. <laughs> like, come on. This should just be like a fun commute read. It's relatively short. That's the thing that people don't understand. It's like 30 pages. It's not huge. I encourage you all to read it. I brought copies. Um, but generally speaking, you know, the, the overview that I sort of try to provide of what the declaration actually is, is I note that it's a UN General Assembly declaration, and this is from um, sort of the actual kind of body of the text itself, um, and sort of the FAQs that you get from the UN at the time it was released, is that UNDRIP emphasizes the rights of indigenous peoples to live in dignity, to maintain and strengthen their own institutions, cultures, and traditions, and to pursue their self-determined development in keeping with their own needs and aspirations. And in a lot of ways, the point that was raised here is a good one, which is that a lot of what you see in UNDRIP is an affirmation of sort of existing, broad-ranging human rights instruments that existed at the international level for some time, but focused on how those will then be um, applied and how those will be structured and what those will look like with the specific needs of indigenous communities. So it's very, very broad-ranging in terms of its scope. Um, it sets out, um, in some detail, individual and collective rights of indigenous communities and indigenous peoples. And it includes articles on culture and identity and language, employment, health, education, you name it. It's very, very broad in terms of its scope. Um, but what it also does is it uh, sets out um, a number, uh, under sort of a number of different headings, um, a variety of these sort of individual and collective rights and how the state should uh, position itself to help promote and protect the rights of indigenous people. And it includes a number of articles regarding s the self-determination of indigenous communities, culture, governance, health, protection for elders, women and children, land rights, which was alluded to as well. Um, it's broad. And I'm going to take you through the actual language of a number of these articles, but the point I try to make is that this, this, this declaration is, is quite large in scope in terms of what it actually captures. Um, but at its core, what it really is, is it's a defined set of standards for how, you know, the way I kind of explain it is it's sort of this defined set of standards for how governments are going to forge a relationship with indigenous people. So the the, this idea that it's a roadmap for reconciliation or it's a framework upon which we, you know, they may build a relationship between sort of the respective governments in Canada and indigenous communities I think is a, is a fairly, captures a lot of the, the spirit and essence behind what I think is in the declaration. 
And now I just want to talk a little bit about the history of Undrip. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating one. I think you could do an entire lecture just on how this document was, um, how this declaration was created, and then how the government of Canada has subsequently um, interacted with it, for lack of a better term. Um, but we only have a limited amount of time. So I want to give you really a Coles Notes version of the history of it before we jump into some more of the substance. So the efforts to draft something like the UN Declaration, uh, it, it, it goes back decades. This has been worked on for some period of time. Um, but it was finally adopted by the General Assembly in September of 2007. And I note here that there were 144 votes in favor, 11 abstentions, 4 against. And the quiz question I have for the group, and you may just not know this, you might just have to intuit it, which states voted against it at the time? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, right here. That's four for four, yeah. Those are the four states that voted against it. Um, and the subsequent conduct of a number of these countries who had initially voted against it has changed since 2007. Um, but at the time, those were the four uh, countries that had sort of refused to sign on and had maintained that they were objecting to it. Um, any guesses or any knowledge maybe as to why, say, I'm not going to ask you to speculate on what the US government was saying at the time, but maybe why Canada in 2007 decided that this was how they were going to vote? with respect to this General Assembly declaration? Yeah? Uh, we, we <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to get too political, but the answer is yes, we did. Um, I certainly don't think that that, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from with that. I think, um, I think as we sort of take a look at the history of the treatment, that actually is, is not, an, it, that is actually probably an informative comment to a certain extent, given that the treatment has evolved and changed with subsequent governments, and even within the, to be fair, even within the Harper government itself at the time. Um, but a lot of what was said around the 2007 that you can sort of see, if you go back and you watch any of the media clips around 2007, um, around like the commentary that was being made, is there was a lot of talk about, oh, we're concerned about this wording in the declaration, and oh, this was sort of changed at the last second, and we're not sure if we're actually comfortable with that. Um, there was a lot of commentary around, oh, well, we have constitutionally enshrined rights in this country already for indigenous communities. W we don't know what kind of impact the declaration is going to have on those, and we want to ensure that our sort of our charter rights and our constitutional order is, is being maintained and respected. And, a lot of these kind of concerns were raised, you know, a lot of comments around, is this going to even be workable? Like, we're going to sign on to this document, can we actually see it brought into, um, to have any sort of meaningful impact in Canadian law? We don't know if we can, so we don't want to agree to it if we can't. Um, that was sort of the commentary around um, the opposition at that time. Um, and for about three years, um, nothing happened. Um, Canada's initial response, as I said, was to vote against it, but it wasn't until 2010 that Canada eventually agreed, yes, we're going to endorse the declaration, um, but with a caveat. So the Harper government at the time, 20, uh, in 2010, said we're going to endorse it, but it was referred to, and this is the language that you'll see in a lot of the kind of like press releases around the time, is that it's an aspirational document. We, saw, we recognize the importance of this declaration for, you know, any number of reasons. Um, but it's not legally binding on us. Um, it's sort of a goalpost that we can strive towards. It doesn't change anything in Canadian law. But yeah, yeah, no, we, we acknowledge its importance. That was sort of the initial step that had been made. And then between 2010 and 2015, nothing really happened. Um, and so at least formally. I'm not going to say that nothing happened. But nothing formally with respect to how the government was going to treat uh, the UN Declaration changed in that period of time. It just nothing happened. Um, and it wasn't until 2015 that the Trudeau government, um, you know, when they were elected in the fall of 2015, essentially said, no, we're gonna re, we're gonna completely rework our understanding of what the declaration means. Um, and in early 2016, they removed the sort of informal objector status that they had to the declaration. And they said, we are going to adopt and implement this declaration in accordance with the Canadian constitution. They were fairly unequivocal with it at that point. Um, Subsequent conversations around the implementation of it um, then sort of were mixed. There was some commentary on the fact that it may be unworkable to implement it in Canadian law. Maybe we need to reframe how we're actually looking at the declaration. So there was some sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say that they, they walked back from their commitment at that time, um, but there was some sense, I think, of uh, they didn't know what was going to come next what steps they were actually going to take to see that through at the time. Um, and it we didn't really get a sense of what that was actually going to mean in practice to implement the UN Declaration 
um, until a uh, member of parliament, Romeo Saganash's private members bill, which came out in December of 2017. So Romeo Saganash was um, um, uh, uh, an NDP member of parliament um, who had introduced a private members bill at the time called um, Bill C-262. This was the bill that was going to, in Canadian law, um, bring forth the implementation of the UN Declaration. That was what it was sort of designed to, to achieve. Um, and if you read the bill itself, Bill C-262, I encourage you to read it. Um, it's also very short. It's, it's very, very, it's like, I don't know what it would be when you print it out. It's like two pages. It's really not long. Um, but it accomplishes um, four very specific goals in the, in the proposed legislation. Um, so there's four elements that it's really getting at. And the first is consistency. So the, the legislation was going to require Canada, in consultation with Indigenous communities, um, to take all measures necessary to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the UN Declaration. So that was sort of the first element of the private members bill. And the second was an affirmation. Um, so the bill was going to inf uh, affirm the declaration as an international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law. And the third element was a plan moving forward. So the legislation was going to require the development of a national action plan to essentially achieve the uh, objectives of the UN Declaration. So everything that's in here, we need to develop an actual national action plan that will help us get there. And last was uh, the introduction of uh, an accountability mechanism. So it introduced um, the idea of an annual reporting requirement regarding the measures taken that in, that in that previous year to see the, uh, the declaration implemented. So, there is, so we've got those four elements. We've got this consistency, we've got this affirmation, we've got this plan for moving forward, and we've got a way to hold ourselves accountable. That was what was laid out in there. So the bill at the time, and this was December of 2017 it was introduced, passed the House of Commons no problem. The Liberal government said they supported it. Um, they didn't introduce it themselves, but they were supportive. Um, there was some opposition to the bill, but certainly not enough to defeat it. Passed the House of Commons no problem. Um, it gets to the Senate we run into problems. Um, it made it to a second reading in the Senate, at which point it was procedurally blocked by a group of senators. I'm gonna comment on what, you know, specifically what their reasons were at the time, um, but it was largely just procedurally blocked. It just kind of got dragged through committees, it got dragged through readings. The process for actually seeing it passed was very, very slow. Um, so what ended up happening with it? Um, uh, I'm hoping that there are some fellow political science nerds in attendance here today who can help me out. Um, but what happens, and you can remember back to maybe civics class in high school to help you with this too, um, but what happens to a bill that's on the order paper for parliament when parliament rises and a writ's dropped for an election? Anybody remember what happens? It dies. Bill gets completely tossed aside. It's got to be reintroduced fresh from the beginning with the next parliament. That's exactly what happened with this bill. Time got dragged on, eventually ran out of time to see it pass, to see it receive royal assent. So with the writ that got dropped for the most recent election, Bill's gone. Um, and Romeo Saganash, you can, if, you, if you Google, he, he's provided some very, um, um, you know, some very sort of specific responses to what he felt about how the bill was being treated and what happened. And you can certainly get a sense of what his perspective was on everything that happened. Um, so it died. So that was sort of the government's last um, and most recent initiative to actually see the declaration implemented. Um, and now we're sort of, uh, you know, at a place where we need to question where we actually go from here. Um, and it's not the end of what I want to share about that. Um, I'm going to get back to that. But before I get into sort of where we go from here, now that you've been sort of led up to the 2019 federal election with respect to its implementation, I want to start talking now a little bit about some of the reasons why I think you understanding a little bit about this history of the declaration, but then actually the substantive content of the declaration itself is so important to um, everybody in this room and frankly everybody in every room in this country. So what do you need to know about UNDRIP? I'll speak to you practically. Um, what do you need to know about the declaration? Everybody in this room. Everything. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, you, you need to know everything. Um, and there's a reason why I say that. Um, and, uh, and, and as I kind of said up top, uh, one of the reasons I suppose you would sort of frame it as a bit more of like a moral imperative and the other is a little bit more practical. But I want to take a look at what I'll call sort of the moral imperative first. Um, and, uh, you know, first off, how many people in the room, just by show of hands, familiar with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, the Calls to Action, 
mini university that tends to be a very, very receptive audience to what's actually in there. For those of you in the room who don't know, because I want us to all be sort of on the same page, 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whose sort of um, you know, uh, primary mandate was to document the history and impact of the residential school system. Um, part of their mandate, they released a report in 2015 that included a number of what they called calls to action that touched on a variety of different uh, actors and institutions in broader Canadian life about what they could do, sort of uh, specific steps and actions that they could take to further this process of, um, of reconciliation in the aftermath of the report. Um, and several of these calls, um, and this should interest everybody who's a lawyer in this room and everyone who's a law student in this room in particular, they're aimed specifically at the legal community, um, which I think is quite powerful. And you probably would have seen a lot of this implemented already being in a law school, because TRC call to action 28 requires law schools to have students take a course in Aboriginal people in the law, and that includes a conversation around the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So they specifically wanted to see legal education reformed to include a, a very broad um, understanding of Aboriginal people in the law, but part of that is specifically enumerated within that call to action is an understanding of this UN Declaration. And this does not end when you leave these hallowed halls of U of C Faculty of Law. Um, it also calls upon lawyers, specifically through the Federation of Law Societies, to receive the same sort of broad cultural competency training on a number of subjects, one of which is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And it's really this that I've sort of tried to carry forward into my role that I do now, because I try to live this as well, and why I try to recognize that legal education doesn't end when you leave this place. And I think the calls to action sort of reflect that there's a lot that the legal profession needs to learn and needs to know as well. Um, so when Romeo Saganash implement, you know, brought in his private members bill, and when we sort of, um, if we keep in mind his comments with these sort of calls to action in the back of our mind, when he proposed the, the bill, he said, implementing UNDRIP is a political, moral, and legal imperative without qualification. Um, he was fairly unequivocal about his position on it. Um, and I think all lawyers, not just for sort of the reasons that they can, you know, they can directly respond, we can all directly respond quite easily by just sitting in this room right now to some portion of these calls to action, which I think is very powerful. But I do think that lawyers in general should be aware of not only what's in here, but that um, you know, indigenous communities really do sort of view this declaration as the path forward, like the roadmap for reconciliation is very much built on, from an indigenous perspective, is very much built on this declaration. And the second reason that I think you really need to know everything that's in here um, is what I sort of alluded to at the beginning of, uh, of our talk. Um, and it's a bit more practical. And if I can just be frank, um, uh, you know, the current government, you know, I didn't know how I was going to phrase this part of my presentation on Monday. <laughs> now I have an idea of how I'm going to phrase this present part of my presentation, um, which was very exciting for me to, to watch the election knowing it was going to impact the talk I was going to give you this week. Um, but the Trudeau government, um, uh, you know, has demonstrated, I think, uh, I think that what they've demonstrated at the very least, um, without getting, you know, too into the political weeds about it, I think they've demonstrated a commitment to implementing UNDRIP. What that looks like, I'm not sure but they've certainly indicated that that is a priority for them. Um, I think it's on their agenda in terms of their political priorities. I, don't, I just don't think you could disagree with that. Um, the only parties in sort of the broader political discourse that were expressing any kind of reservation to this notion of implementation wa were the, like the Conservatives and the PPC. Like they were the only parties that said anything during the debates that I heard where they said, uh, you know. So the idea that just because we're in a minority parliament situation, that's then going to make this idea of implementation impossible, I don't think is the case, although minority parliaments are interesting, so I guess we'll see. Um, but I think they've identified it as a priority, um, and they've been fairly consistent with that. Um, but we don't have six months to go through every single one of these articles in a lot of detail. Um, we don't, even though I'd love to do that with you. Um, but I want to focus on a few that have stood out to me as ones that seem particularly relevant to Canadian legal practices, and they're the ones I bring up all the time when I talk to lawyers about this, because again, I'm great at parties. So um, even beyond sort of the moral imperative that, you know, Romeo Saganash is alluding to, um, you know, and what I've sort of referred to as back into the calls of action, you know, what I always like to say to, to lawyers, because, you know, I, I, work, I work for Blake's, I work on Bay Street, I deal with corporate lawyers all the time, um, you know, and a lot of people in an audience, I'm used to people sitting there and sort of saying, like, I get it, it's an international instrument, though. Talking about international law, you're telling me it's about a UN declaration, it's international law, I don't think it's really going to impact me, I don't think it's going to affect me, what I do day to day, yeah, yeah, maybe, the, you know, maybe you have a very receptive audience who thinks, yeah, it's really great to know from just like an intellectual curiosity point of view. But, you know, look, I don't want to practice indigenous law, 
So do I really need to know what's in here? Because um, I don't think it's really going to, to impact me or the work that I do. And every time I, I, you know, and I'm not saying I've heard that from anybody in, in my current position, but any time, you know, I kind of ask myself that question, if, or what would I do if I were a lawyer who would provide me with that comment? Because again, apparently I'm having a conversation with myself. Um, <laughs> the response I'd give is, well, like, read it. Have you taken the time to actually see what's in here and know what's in here? Because if there's political will and there's political pressure to see sort of the declaration form this roadmap for reconciliation, this is going to help define if you sort of take the, the sort of current government's perspective on this, this is going to help define the relationship between the government of Canada and in indigenous communities in Canada going forward. If that's, if that's the case, um, you know, they're going to see it implemented, then um, I think there's a really good chance that it's going to impact, um, you know, uh, the broader legal landscape. It's going to have an impact on a number of laws and policies and the way in which government um, engages with indigenous communities. And if that's the case, I will argue that it will impact a very, it could impact a very diverse range of practice areas that I don't think everybody in this room would have anticipated stepping into the room today. And we're going to go through a few reasons why. Um, uh, and again, I'm not going to have time to sort of run through every single article, every single practice area. I certainly encourage you to read it because it touches on a lot of things which you've, a number of you have already sort of commented on. There's a lot in here around education you know, uh, things that'd be relevant to sort of um, what you'd consider more sort of, I guess, traditional family law practices around, um, you know, adoption and child protective services. There's a lot in here. There's a ton that I'm just not going to get to be able to talk about. So as a, you know, again, I sort of encourage you to read. But one of the, um, one of the elements that I frequently like to bring up, um, you know, in terms of specific UN declaration articles, um, is all kind of framed around this idea of the duty to consult. And a lot of you are in law school, a lot of you will be familiar with your constitutional law class. I hope in your constitutional law class you got a good overview of what, you know, Section 35 looks like and the duty to consult and hibernation and all these sort of cases. Um, but for those of you who sort of aren't familiar, um, I'm going to talk a little bit of detail about what the duty to consult is. And when I bring this one up, um, uh, you know, when I talk a little bit about this, the response that I get from lawyers who work in things like project financing or resource development, they know about this. And if they don't, they should, because the duty to consult interacts with a number of different corporate practice areas um, that I, you know, I frequently reiterate just how important it's going to be. Um, but it, you know, even if you're going to, you know, you don't want to do broader corporate work, but you want to work in sort of uh, indigenous, you know, litigation that involves indigenous communities, this is going to be really, really important to talk about. So before we get into the specific articles, we do need to just talk a little bit about what the duty to consult is. So for those of you who don't know, and for those of you who do, this will be a very sort of Coles Notes version, but the duty to consult is an obligation that flows from the honor of the Crown. Um, and a lot of what's entailed in that duty has been outlined in the case law, but essentially um, it requires the Crown to consult Aboriginal peoples before taking action that could adversely affect any of their asserted or established um, rights under the Constitution. So it ensures that the Crown's sort of acting honorably and not acting unilaterally and actually engages in a process of uh, engagement and consultation with Indigenous communities. So what does that actually mean in practice? It can vary. So, you know, you'll frequently, I mean, I mean I'm sure you're all familiar with things like, you know, environmental impact assessments or providing funding for Indigenous groups to do environmental impact assessments if there's a particular resource project that might um, have some sort of impact or potentially have an impact on traditional lands. Um, you know, it could uh, involve ongoing uh, participation or funding for groups to do their own studies. The, the duty's broad and it's not well defined. Um, but it, there's just sort of this notion that there's a, an overriding um, consultation requirement that varies depending on a number of different factors that I just won't have time to get into today. Um, so there's this broad-based duty that's sort of constitutionally recognized. It's come out of the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence. Um, that sort of exists right now. It's well defined. People who work in these practice areas are familiar with it. Um, but um, what about the future? And what about under it? Does it have anything that might impact what we sort of have traditionally conceived of as the duty to consult? I think the answer is, um, well, let's read it. <laughs> um, so while the declaration itself doesn't contain any references specifically to the duty to consult, as we sort of understand it in Canadian law, um, there are references to consulting Indigenous communities, but not the duty as we know it. It does include something else, and this is the language that, if you've probably heard anything in the media <coughs> around the UN Declaration, these are the five words that you've probably heard. Free, prior, and informed consent. I'm going to call it FPIC or FIPIC for short, because I'm going to be referring to that phrase quite a lot. 
So this term right here, free prior and informed consent, it appears a lot in UNDRIP. And frankly, it's become a very politicized phrase in the broader discourse about this declaration and what it's actually going to mean for the relationship between the government of Canada and provincial governments and indigenous communities. Um, one thing I, I observed during the most recent election in the debates was, um, and you'll just, but you'll just see this from political actors all the time, um, they talk about the declaration and the, you know, the, the sort of thing that gives them pause when it comes to um, sort of providing a full-throated endorsement of the declaration itself is this language around free prior and informed consent. And some um, analogize this to essentially amounting to a veto right for indigenous communities over things like resource projects or, or really anything that's going to impact their rights. Um, but they see this language of free prior and informed consent and this consent requirement essentially amounts to a veto. That's the argument that you'll hear from people. It was the argument that was raised when the you know, government initially opposed it in 2007. They were making reference to that fact. They were making reference to that fact in 2019. That dialogue hasn't changed. Um, that's sort of the perspective that you get from sort of one side on this. Um, but um, that is not how necessarily how it would um, be understood within our broader sort of Canadian legal or constitutional order. And it's language that, um, you know, from an indigenous perspective, a lot of indigenous communities find offensive, this dialogue around, oh, you're just going to get a veto, and oh, you're just going to stop, you know, projects. Um, you know, Senator Marie Sinclair, who draft, who was, you know, sort of the head person with respect to the TRC uh, calls to action, um, said that as a principle, what this language means is that before you affect indigenous land, you have to speak to nations that are impacted, you have to have permission, but felt that this idea of like a veto language was, um, was inappropriate and kind of misses the point of what this is actually all about. Um, you know, some people that I've spoken to who kind of have, you know, engaged with the duty to consult because of the work that they do, you know, I've heard some people say, uh, you know, this might just kind of be understood within the broader duty to consult as we kind of already have it in Canadian law. I don't know if it'll actually change things too fundamentally, but others disagree. There are others who are quite adamant that this, you know, this language um, may have unintended consequences and we don't know what it's actually going to mean in practice when it comes to how you're supposed to engage with and consult with Indigenous communities. They just don't know. Um, the one thing I've observed, and again, I'm not, I'm not sort of here to tell you what this is going to mean, because I think the broader point is that a lot of people don't know what it's going to mean. Um, and uh, if you read any of the transcripts around um, sort of Senate proceedings on Romeo Saganash's private member's bill, a lot of federal officers sort of came before the Senate and said, yeah, we don't actually know what this language means. Like, there's no really agreed upon definition of what it means to obtain free prior and informed consent. We just don't know. Um, there's, or at least there's no agreement. There's, there's some ideas about what it might mean, but we don't know. Um, so the, the question sort of becomes, if we implement UNDRIP, and there's a number of, like, this isn't the only article that includes this. Like, this is like, you know, you have to obtain free prior and informed consent before adopting or implementing legislative or administrative <coughs> measures that would impact indigenous peoples. That's, I mean, that's, the language is relatively straightforward. But it appears in a number of different articles. This article here, 28, is specifically with respect to providing redress or restitution or compensation for lands, territories, or resources that were taken or occupied or damaged without this free prior and informed consent. Um, so there's sort of, this is all about kind of restitution. This right here is built around, the uh, Article 29 is built around not storing or disposing hazardous materials on territories of Indigenous people without their free prior informed consent. So the question I always consider and the one that I frequently ask and the one that I think the legal community is asking right now as well is how do we make sense of this language around free prior and informed consent um, within the sort of existing and very active uh, duty to consult that exists within Canadian law? that actors in industry participate in, that indigenous communities participate in. There is a framework in place. Um, and you can kind of take whatever perspective you think on where that actually falls and, you know, you can have your own sort of opinions around it, but there is something in place right now. So what does this mean? Does it actually require um, anything about how we understand the responsibility of the government to consult with indigenous communities? Does, does it change anything? Does it elevate the standard? Is it kind of consistent with the same sort of approach and standard? Um, you know, I don't have an answer for you because I don't think anybody really has a sense of it. But I would not be shocked if we see the declaration implemented that this sort of language that you see in these um, different articles gets litigated at some point. Like it seems sort of at some point someone's gonna have to figure out, and it's gonna be the court, <laughs> um, is probably gonna have to figure out 
well, what does this actually mean, and what does it mean in relation to how we've already conceived of the broader duty to consult, um, and how far that goes, and when it gets extended? Is it going to change the framework or the analysis in some way? I can see it getting litigated quite easily, because as I said, um, you know, some interpret this quite simply as just being, this is about making an effort towards mutual, like mutually acceptable arrangements, and, and really giving an honest opportunity for um, indigenous communities to genuinely influence the decision-making process, to have like an actual meaningful impact in the decisions that are being made. Um, you know, but there's no, there's sort of a broad disagreement about it. And I've actually, I brought a book in today, which I just want to highlight for you. I don't have copies for everybody, um, like I do for the, the declaration. But I do, I do strongly encourage this book. And Amanda and I were actually talking about this. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, it's a collection of essays, sort of, I mean, spearheaded by John Burroughs, but it's a number of um, Aboriginal law academics put together this collection, I believe through CG. Um, but uh, it's called Braiding Legal Orders. This book is all about implementation of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and it's fantastic. The essays are like 10, 11 pages long. Um, I'm not paid to plug, this is not paid advertising. Like I'm not, <laughs> um, I'm not getting a check from John Burroughs for suggesting this book. But it's, it's a really quick read, and what this does is this identifies a lot of the broader debates that are ongoing about, okay, we've talked a lot about implementation. What is that actually gonna look like? What's going to be the role of government in implementation? What's the role of indigenous communities going to be in implementation? And they talk a lot about the fact, a lot of the authors take varying perspectives on it, but a lot of them take very specific um, positions around what this language around free prior and informed consent means when it's actually brought into sort of, breathe, when you breathe life into this in sort of our broader Canadian legal and constitutional discourse. Um, and they take a variety of different perspectives on that, but it's a really, really great book from that perspective to get a sense of where they think things are heading, um, and they really engage with this debate. But I think what sort of becomes undeniable when you look really closely at it is it's, it's, I, don't know, I don't know what it's going to mean. I really, really don't. I have no idea. Um, and I don't know how the courts will make sense of it or how industry will make sense of it or how uh, indigenous communities will make sense of it. But I find it interesting that there's, there's an article on the... Um, uh, the uh, Ministry of Justice website that sort of deals um, um, specifically with sort of these ten principles of reconciliation, um, and one of the um, one of the principles uh, about sort of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples, one actually acknowledges um, the government's commitment to sort of going beyond the duty of consult with the aim of securing this. I don't know what that means, um, but I think it's interesting that you know governments using this language too. So something is going to have to be determined about what exactly this sort of wording means. Um, and I, I, you know, I just think it's going to have, if, you know, if it in fact reframes the analysis around like the duty to consult and actually engaging with indigenous communities, um, and if it changes the analysis in any way, and I don't know if it will, but if it does, that's going to have a wide range of impacts on a variety of people. Um, you know, practicing in a lot of different areas. And I kind of alluded to them at the top. Like, if you're working in things like project financing for large infrastructure projects, probably going to be relevant. If you're working in resource extraction industries for either indigenous communities or on the behalf of corporations, um, it's, it, you know, it's going to matter. It's going to have relevance to Aboriginal law um, like litigation. Like it's you know, it's going to have these wide-ranging implications um, because there are a lot of practice areas that you wouldn't necessarily assume sitting here as like a first or a second or even a third-year law student um, where they, you know, they frequently intersect, depending on what kind of work you do and what kind of clients you have, might frequently intersect with this duty as a part of their, uh, you know, their day-to-day -day business. So there's some broad-ranging implications there, at least potentially. And the second element that I always like to highlight and um, uh, is sort of the intersection between the declaration and intellectual property law. And I think this one's um, a little less dry than the, the duty to consult. Um, I think this one is... Uh, is, is really visible and obvious when we take a close look at it. And, and something Amanda kind of alluded to, um, but I don't know if it was clear when I, you know, I did litigation, I spent a um, huge chunk of the beginning of my career doing intellectual property litigation. So I sort of lived in this IP space, and then I've done work in the, uh, you know, I've done work for my home community, I've done work for the Métis Nation. Um, and uh, I, I, I think a lot about sort of the intersection between um, intellectual property law and indigenous communities and traditional knowledge. I just spend a lot of time thinking about that for the third time because I'm great at parties. Um, and so, 
when I think about these kind of things, and I've spent the better part of like the last two years telling all the IP practitioners I know, because I still know quite a few of them, a lot of them are sort of former colleagues, is hey, have you guys read this? There's a lot in here about intellectual property law, or that could impact intellectual property law. Are you guys thinking about this? And when, you know, they tell me to calm down. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but I always like to highlight it, and, um, and I can't tell you, like if I talk to an IP practitioner and then I start to take them through these articles, they're like, oh yeah, interesting. Hmm. Um, and this is all probably, details on this is probably better saved for a future lecture. So again, Amanda, depending on how you think I do with all of this. <laughs> I'd, love to, uh, I'd love to come back and talk a little bit more detail about this sort of intersection. But, um, you know, one thing that I like to, you know, I, I like to identify when, you know, to kind of breathe some life into UNDRIP a little bit is, um, you know, some of the, from an indigenous community's perspective, some of the shortcomings in the sort of existing intellectual property law that exists. Um, and how it, at times, um, from, you know, from their perspectives, is not adequately, you know, it's not providing adequate protection for indigenous traditional knowledge. So what do I mean by traditional knowledge? I'm just gonna give you like a, there's no consistent definition of it, but kind of pulled from like the AFN's definition of it, and then the Government of Canada has a definition that I've sort of taken a look at, but really what I'm talking about is sort of collective knowledge or traditional cultural expressions uh, of indigenous communities. So these sort of traditional creations that can touch on a variety of different areas. So it could touch on like soil and plant taxonomy, cultural information, medicines, music, arts, architecture, transportation, principles of governance. It's very, very broad. Um, but one thing I've sort of noticed when I've taken a look at this is it's not hard to find a lot of commentary out there from like the AFN or um, various indigenous communities where they're specifically highlighting how they're trying to seek legal protection for their traditional knowledge that their community holds and they try to intersect and, and deal with that with the existing IP laws and it do, it's just not working. Um, it's, it's sort of coming up short for them. Um, and there's a few case studies that I always like to, that I always kind of like to highlight and take you through a few articles right now just to identify a couple of these. So this one right here, um, I'll just talk about this very, very briefly. As I said, I do like an entire lecture that's just around these case studies. Um, but this right here, this is called the Zia Sun Symbol. This is an American context, but I think it illustrates the broader point. Um, so the Zia Sun Symbol, it's, it's, a it's considered a sacred symbol for the Zia Pueblo in New Mexico. But this symbol has now found itself into, I guess, sort of the broader cultural discourse. And this symbol is now featured, it's considered sacred, and this symbol is now featured on the state flag of New Mexico. And one of the more interesting um, articles that I came across, and this is gonna be, this is I think the most hipster created sentence ever. It exists on an organic juice bottling company's products in Brooklyn, New York. Um, literally, like, like companies are utilizing this because man, this looks cool. Like this looks interesting, I'm just gonna use it. Um, and it's sort of, so it's, it's kind of being, you know, it's part of like whatever you might want to refer to as sort of this broader kind of cultural appropriation discussion. But what I think it sort of illustrates is that like the Zia Pueblo um, have actually started to develop a process where you can engage and consult with them about the use of this. And I remember reading online that there were some conversations around them providing funding for their community where you could provide a donation to their community support programs in exchange for getting their sort of permission or license to actually use the symbol. But for years it had just been taken and just used and there's not, um, at the time, there wasn't really um, a fantastic recourse for them to be able to adequately protect this because it had just sort of fallen into the broader public discourse. I mean, it's on the state flag of New Mexico, for example, um, and sort of without their permission. And, you know, if there's any sort of IP practitioners in the room or people who are familiar with IP, they start to think about, like, well, you know, what could you do from a trademarks perspective? And you, know, you start to think about this thing. And there's some challenges there um, that sort of, I think, apply broadly when it comes to intersecting IP law with indigenous communities. And there's a few things that'll be intuitive to you if you've studied IP law to any extent, but um, you know, a lot of what exists as sort of this broader traditional knowledge for indigenous communities is collectively owned. Um, there may not necessarily be the sense of originality or novelty that you're used to seeing in intellectual property law because these things are, have existed for time immemorial in some cases. Um, so there's some complications around trying to get this sort of adequately protected. And the, the other sort of case study that I like to bring up is sort of twofold. And it's actually referenced in this really great and very short C, uh, CBC article about sort of the, the Dene's use of um, spruce gum as a traditional medicine. And I worked in uh, patent and pharmaceutical litigation for, for a chunk of time. And um, when you think about sort of IP protections for medicines, you think of patents. 
and you think about the ability to sort of develop these, you know, these new amazing fantastic drugs and you can get some sort of protection over your monopoly in that for a period of time. But then you sort of look at it through this context of this thing that is used as a sacred traditional medicine, but it has a spiritual component to it. Um, and you know, you hear from members of the community who refer to the fact that they feel as though um, uh, or certain responsibility to protect it from a sense of exploitation. Well, something like the use of spruce gum as a medicine, like it's just out there now. Like people can produce it, people do produce it, people sell it, it's commercially exploited. And they feel like there's no recourse for them to be able to um, seek its protection in the sort of existing IP structures. And there may be reasons why, like, you know, sometimes I've, I've sort of talked about, like, you know, you look at, like, the, what IP is designed to protect. It's not, it was never conceived of to protect something like a traditional medicine. So no wonder it's not actually being used from their perspective, right? Um, so there's some concerns there, is really what I'm trying to get at, um, without sort of casting any sort of particular judgment or opinions. Um, there's definitely concerns on the part of indigenous communities when it comes to protecting things like traditional medicines or sacred symbols, um, and the other, you know, the other art in, art in the same article, there's another instance of this, which is this like UK fashion label. Like, you know, but you've, you've heard, you've all heard stories, right, about like all of a sudden a fashion label has come out and they've just sort of taken something from an indigenous community. They've all, they ultimately apologized and then stopped with what they were doing in this case, it was this UK retailer. But it's just, it's these kind of instances where they feel like, where's our recourse, what do we actually do? And in, in any case, you know, utilizing the existing IP structures, like any sort of legal recourse, it's expensive, it's time consuming, um, you know, there's a lot of concerns there that get raised by indigenous communities about sort of where it might fall short. And, um, you know, regardless of what you sort of think about these specific critiques, I think it's important to keep that in mind because what is in UNDRIP are a variety of articles that speak directly to cultural, um, sort of cultural property and traditional knowledge. So if we look at Article 11, it specifically, may, you know, asserts that Indigenous people have the right to maintain, protect, and develop the past, present, and future, man future manifestations of their cultures. So they are in fact under this article, and you know, they're given this right, this right is affirmed, that they can revitalize their cultural traditions and they can protect and develop their manifestations of culture from past and present. And it gives a number of different examples that would sort of, you know, um, I think uh, jump out, like you know, designs, historic sites, ceremonies, technologies. And there's actually specific references that later on in the article to things like spiritual property that's taken without their free prior and informed consent. There's that phrase again. Um, and in the need to provide adequate restitution to these communities. And it actually goes on to include um, the right to protect and develop um, not just cultural expressions, but the broader traditional knowledge when it comes to seeds, medicines, prop knowledge and properties of fauna and flora, oral traditions, designs, game. It's very, very broad in scope is the point I'm trying to make. And if you get the sense that uh, which you will hear from organizations like AFN, that the current sort of IP structures that are designed to um, you know, protect these sort of creations um, aren't sufficient or adequate to meet their needs to sufficiently um, control and protect and develop their manifestations of culture or medicines. And I'll take your question in just a second for sure. Um, you know, the question I sort of raise is, is if we've said that we're going to, you know, we're going to implement UNDRIP, part of the federal government's commitment is to implementing UNDRIP is a conversation around how we need to maybe reform our laws or policies. Well, if you're seeing these critiques from indigenous communities right now, I think this just becomes another manifestation or basis upon which to assert that something might have to change. New processes might need to be developed. Um, the existing processes may need to be reformed. We may need to develop something entirely new. I don't know what it's gonna look like in practice, but I always raise it with IP practitioners because if you think that in your work, you're gonna intersect with what would sort of be considered under this broad heading of indigenous traditional knowledge, whether that's for indigenous communities or if you're involved in maybe potential litigation on a company that's accused of, of doing something, you know, um, in violation of this, you might want to be aware of the fact that, you know, coming down the pike, you know, maybe five, maybe ten years now, maybe, you know, I don't know, but if this is kind of where things might be headed, um, it seems to me like you would want to know about this because it speaks directly to a number of concrete criticisms that indigenous communities have been raising for some time about the existing IP structures that exist. So before I jump into the next point, there was a comment at the back or a question at the back. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. 
as part of a broader maybe like cultural discourse. I mean, I certainly think like there's a lot of people who, you know, like I've given this talk before and students will sort of talk about like, well, you know, they, they'd heard of a particular instance where a community's, you know, um, you know, uh, particular goods or designs had been appropriated and then sort of as part of a broader social media discourse, they had been, you know, forced to kind of step back from that or return certain items. I think the, the challenge that, you know, faces UNDRIP implementation in general is that I don't know where a lot of this is going to be headed. When I read this, I'm always just like, this feels like, this feels big to me when I read it. Like, it's powerful and there's a lot in here that I don't know is currently part of our broader sort of political discourse. I think there's certainly a discourse around the, the desire to sort of reframe the roadmap to reconciliation and, and let's, let's make these a priority. And certainly as you go through the articles, like if you read it and you're actually taking a look at it, you will without a doubt identify things that the government is already doing to try to satisfy certain aspects of the declaration and the standards that it sets out. Like you'll see steps that, you know, government's taken. It's not as if they haven't done anything in a lot of these different spaces. But what it becomes is it becomes another portion of the dialogue, particularly from a legal perspective, about, well, what do our laws and policies actually mean? And are they achieving what's in here? Are they, cons are they in fact, consistent with what's in this declaration? And I don't know how that'll get determined. I don't know what, pers you know what positions the government might take when it comes to things like cultural artifacts or national museums, or who knows? Um, I don't know. But um, this, to me, is, you know, the thing that I always kind of take away from it is that um, and this kind of, I think, sort of jumps uh, nicely into, and this is, again, just sort of gets into the same thing around, like, it specifically references intellectual property over things like traditional knowledge. Um, this kind of, I think, leads nicely into sort of where the future of UNDRIP and, and sort of where things are headed here. But what I think is, what I think becomes clear, and the, and the sort of takeaway point that I always try to leave with, um, with students or colleagues or really anybody I talk about this, is that, you know, um, there's a lot of conversation around this declaration and a lot of people refer to the fact that this is going to be a, a roadmap for reconciliation. That's the phrase that always gets. And in this book, Braiding Legal Orders, talks a lot about what that actually means. And, and as I said, I highly recommend you read it. Um, but I think what we can't lose sight of is, as Canadians, even like if you're not Indigenous, you're not from an Indigenous community, you don't know much about Indigenous community, like, it doesn't matter. But I think what you need to know is that, and I think Ken Coates, this is a, a, a sort of a reference from Ken Coates. He's a, He's a Monk Senior Fellow and he teaches at the University of Saskatchewan and he, um, he's, per, you know, he's kind of um, prepared a bit of a paper on this. And he's referred to the fact that, and he <coughs> thinks all Canadians should know, like, like this declaration resonates really powerfully with Indigenous communities. They take it very seriously. This means something to them in a very, very deep and very, very meaningful way. I think that, I think that him attributing this, this, this resonance is powerful and I think it's very true. And I think you see it in you see it in the comments that Murray Sinclair has made around this broader dialogue. You see it in the comments that Romeo Saganash made in, um, in both the, when he introduced his private member's bill and when it ultimately fell by the wayside. You'll see it when you read their commentary around this. It resonates with indigenous communities. So I think that we as sort of a, you know, as a broader country need to, and the, certainly the government is in a place where they have to, you know, they've got to, they've got to, they've seemed to have acknowledged that, but they need to realize that once this gets sort of, if this gets brought in and implemented, like, this is going to be a very powerful, um, a very sort of powerful piece of our kind of broader dialogue with Indigenous communities, and you can't really lose sight of that. Um, so I don't know if that really gets at exactly what you were talking about, but I just think that it's important to remember that this is not just something that you know, is a piece of paper that exists as this international instrument and it's just gonna, yeah, we, we love it. We're, you know, we're implementing it. Isn't this great? And here's these things that we'll, we'll strive towards. That's, that's part of it. But I think the resonance piece is really powerful because I think if, you know, if we're meaningfully, if, if you know, the, the government is serious about engaging in a process of reconciliation or allowing this to form the roadmap for it, um, I think they need to recognize that, you know, indigenous communities take that quite seriously. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, and, I, and there's actually a quote I want to share with you that I think makes the point even better than I could, which is um, it's from Grand Chief um, Dr. Matthew Kuncom from the Grand Council of the Crees. And um, Ken Coates and Blaine Fable put together a, a paper called Understanding UNDRIP, which is great. It's from the McDonald laurier Institute. It's a good kind of overview of the history of the UN Declaration. And this is a quote from from this Grand Chief. He said, the way forward to achieve a new relationship between Canada and the Indigenous peoples and to put our communities on a path of healing and inclusion is not a mystery. 
The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People lays out a framework and a path for addressing the historic injustices suffered by Indigenous peoples, and if implemented properly, can lay the foundation for the elimination of poverty, dispossession, and the kinds of intolerable living conditions that produce epidemic suicides among our youth. This bill provides the opportunity to do this and should be supported wholeheartedly. He's referring to Romeo Saganash's bill at that point. So, as I said, as part of the broader dialogue that exists in sort of in Canada right now, there's, you know, there's a lot of people express this concern about, you know, how do we make under it compatible with Canada's, you know, political and constitutional architecture. Um, but given the importance that this is placed, you know, the importance that's placed upon this in Indigenous communities and the commitments that I've seen come out from sort of the current government, um, I think that the, imp the broader implementation of this and what it ends up looking like in practice is going to be at the center of this reconciliation dialogue for the foreseeable future. I think that this is where, this is where it's going to live. And it's why, um, you know, and lawyers play such a critical part in that, um, is sort of the broader policy discussion and the broader legal reform discussion. That, that's why I always think that lawyers should be familiar with that. Um, because as I said, they, they take it quite seriously. So political developments. I didn't do a slide, because as I said, I changed this at 11 o'clock last night about what I wanted to talk about. So um, I'm sure the election results are still fresh in everyone's minds. Um, but the, both the Liberals and the NDP, and I'm almost certain the Green did as well, um, they campaigned on the implementation of UNDRI. They all said they would. They all committed to it. Um, I'm not sure if being in a minority parliament situation complicates things, but um, I think we need to understand that, as I said, this has been identified as a priority. Um, and I could foresee, I don't know this, it's not like I have insider knowledge, but um, I could foresee a situation where the, you know, a similar private member's bill or a similar piece of legislation to what we had seen in the previous parliament gets introduced at some point. I could see it happening. Um, and I think you'll have to be mindful of that. But what was really interesting, and this is a development that's going on today, I think the press conference would have just finished, um, but BC is the first jurisdiction in Canada that at the provincial level is actually introducing its own legislation to implement UNDRIP in the province of British Columbia. So they're even ahead of the federal government on this. Um, for, you know, um, I, I don't know what's in the bill, I haven't read it. Literally read an article on CBC this morning talking about how they're gonna have a press conference announcing that it's being put forward and needs to be voted on and passed, so I don't know what's gonna happen with it. Um, but BC has now committed themselves to introducing, at least at the provincial level, a piece of legislation that'll uh, sort of reinforce its commitment to the UN Declaration. So this stuff is happening already. Like it's not, this isn't all just me sitting there, like I said, having a conversation with myself, thinking about this all theoretically. Um, a lot of this looks theoretical, but I, I do think it's gonna have some broad practical implications. Benefit for me, I guess, is that I can tell you, I don't know what they are though. So it's kind of like a bait and switch in that extent, but, um, because I can't tell you what's gonna happen, but something's gonna happen, and isn't that intriguing? <laughs> um, I feel it's intriguing. So if something's going to happen, um, which I think is, is, seems to be the path that we're headed down, um, I think you, you, you sort of owe it to yourself to set yourself up to be part of this broader conversation and dialogue by just knowing what's actually in there. So to take the time to review it, familiarize yourself with it, and I think you'll surprise yourself even if you came into the room today with zero interest in practicing in the Aboriginal law space. I think you will find a lot uh, interesting about it, and I think you might even have a particular legal interest that, uh, that UNDRIP might speak to in some way, even if it may not necessarily impact your future legal careers, um, that you'd want to be mindful of as part of the broader dialogue. So I've spoken enough, but I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah. of sort of shifting that broader dialogue. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you get at what's, um, I think your point's a good one. Um, I certainly know from, you know, uh, working in my own indigenous community too, and you hear this from, from people from a wide uh, diversity of range of backgrounds, but sort of the burden of having to, to do the work and the burden of having to educate, for example, sort of non-indigenous people about these issues, like that it can feel overwhelming or they can feel like it becomes a something that they have to spend a lot of time and energy doing um, and sort of splitting themselves a little bit. I know that's a broader conversation that happens in the diversity space all the time. Um, so I think your point is a good one. 
I think there's a role for sort of everybody to be playing in this, right? If we're talking about sort of this being a part of the roadmap to reconciliation, um, there's a role for everyone to play. Um, I think sort of government has indicated that they want to take, at least the current government wants to take a certain leadership position on this. I don't know what that's going to look like. I mean, you certainly see in things like um, the current duty to consult framework that exists with indigenous communities. There's like there's roles for government and then industry plays roles and then indigenous communities play a role as part of this and there's sort of a broader negotiation and dialogue that occurs. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to take your question offline too. I'll stick around to you, but I know we got this class till two. I'll stick around all afternoon if you guys want to talk about this. I clearly have nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I love talking about it, so I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you after for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a that's a great question. You sound like uh, you're already thinking like uh, like a litigator, mm -hmm. um, thinking about different angles you can take. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I don't I don't really have an answer for that about what that might end up looking like. I mean, you're you're completely correct when you say that as part of this broader duty to consult, this isn't just only the government of Canada and an indigenous community sort of sit in a room together. Like it, it frequently intersects and involves representatives from industry and like it's just, there's a lot of parties and actors that get involved. Um, I don't know. Um, as I said, I think what's, you know, this language is gonna have to, there's gonna have to be some understanding reached about what this language is gonna mean and how that's going to change the duty to consult, if it's gonna change the duty to consult. And if it does, to what extent it, you know, it, it then shifts certain onuses, I don't know. But I think you're thinking about it the right way, which is that um, it's quite broad. There's a lot of room in here um, to sort of breathe some meaning into it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, you're, I think you're thinking about it the right way. But I don't have, a, I don't have an obvious answer for you. Yeah, in the back. Uh, I think you're basically just saying to my point about the duty to consult. Mm -hmm. You're writing in a constitutional construct saying the legislature thinks that the duty to consult yeah. does not fall upon the legislative process. Right. Right. And this, that seems completely at odds with what it says about bringing something into the room. Like, do you know what it, like, what it would take to yeah. make things consistent? Is it in the legislature's right decision, or is it also the legislature to really put that into the structural and process? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So that's, um, and for those of you who don't know, or aren't overly familiar with that, because it's new, it's relatively new in the grand scheme of things, and have been subject to, I know, any number of appeals that were ongoing with it. Um, but yeah, I think when you take a look at something like this, it sort of moves beyond, um, or at least it suggests quite clearly when you read this article, that this is sort of before adopting and implementing legislative measures. Like, it's, it's I don't know, it's there. Um, in terms of then how this might impact what sort of exists in the current Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence, I don't know what independent actions the government might be willing to take but sort of amending their processes for any of this, um, if it's going to fall on the government's end of things, or if it's going to require this to be litigated before, you know, if there is some disagreement about what this will actually mean in practice, and does this mean, in fact, that, you know, um, what was that issue in that case would then be treated differently in light of this declaration? That might need to be something that ends up getting litigated. It's possible. Um, I'm not sure what position the government will take on that. I don't know. But I think that, again, this is really great and really inspiring to see this in all of you because you're all thinking about this the right way, which is that I've learned this year about what exists right now. This is making me think that, well, if this were in place, that might actually be decided differently or the court might look at it through a different lens in light of this being in place. And I think that's the right way to think about it, which is that while there's not a lot of answers right now, there's a lot of really great questions. And you've already started to, I think, identify some of those questions. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. One has been the experience of other international actors um, sort of implementing yeah. this and truly be maybe informed by their experience. So do they perhaps have definitions that they could have done differently? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so sort of twofold. I'm not overly familiar with everything that's been taken at sort of a state by state level and, or country by country level. 
Um, there are some international commentaries about what these different sort of words and phrases like free, prior, and informed consent mean. I think actually during the Senate testimony on the private members bill, they alluded to the fact that there were some at the UN who had already attempted to try to provide some direction on what those terms mean. And you can read all about that and I won't get into it in detail. But yeah, I, I do think there are some things that exist more broadly that might be utilized in a potential, um, a potential piece of litigation or um, proceeding before the Supreme Court, potentially. Um, I could see that for sure. In terms of what other countries are doing, I do, th I do think it's sort of informative in sort of the broader dialogue to talk a little bit about what countries are doing um, in relation to their indigenous communities to try to get a perspective of what they're doing in the reconciliation space. And it's interesting that you bring that up. This, this is not specifically about the duty to consult, but when I've, when I've spoken about IP um, in the past, it's always been within the broader context of teaching um, a bit of a critical analysis of sort of introductory property law and understanding what property means um, from a sort of an indigenous perspective. And the case study that I always bring up um, is the, the um, there's a river in New Zealand. I don't know if any are familiar with this, but the Maori in New Zealand and the, the Wanagune River case. Anybody familiar with this? Show of hands if anybody's heard of this river in New Zealand. And yeah, so um, from my notes kind of in front of me where I had a very sort of detailed breakdown, but from my recollection off the top of my head in terms of what was done, the go essentially the government had entered into an arrangement with the Maori in New Zealand to declare the river a person, to give it personhood with the subsequent um, duties and responsibilities that would be carried with that as part of this broader kind of conversation around stewardship. Um, and I, I introduced that as an element in that conversation to talk about you know, you've learned about fee simple and this relationship with the land as being sort of this proprietary, transactional, fee simple. Well, there's actually another way you could conceive of those same sort of duties and responsibilities with respect to what you consider land. Um, and that was actually recognized at the government level where they've entered into this partnership of giving it this sort of elevated status and recognition of sort of personhood in this river, acknowledging that that's in fact how the community conceived of it. Um, and there's interesting steps that are being taken. Like that was done in partnership with the government of New Zealand. So I think you're, there's always case studies that you can look to internationally to get a sense of what governments are doing. There's a lot of working groups too at the UN level where they talk about, like they report on what different states are doing because a lot of this stuff is gonna look very differently depending on the country that you're looking at too, right? Like the idea of you know being able to provide redress or like legal processes, um, you know, there are legal processes in Canada and I know that you know people can be um, critical of, of that. Um, but then you look at, you know, countries and processes that might exist in, say, South America or Brazil, like, you know, these things might look differently in terms of what they look like when they're implemented, depending on which country you're talking about too, right? So, um, but I do think that sort of the international space can be informative from that perspective. It's a powerful story and whenever I kind of go through it in detail with the students, like, it's, it's always interesting to talk to law students about it too, especially because they um, don't really have, have never really conceived of it in that way before. Yeah. Well, sort of separating it like the specific, that sounds like a really good like law school question to sort of formulate, right? Um, I, I mean, I'm not gonna comment specifically around like sort of the trademark issues and how that might actually look in practice. But I think again, what you've identified is a really, really interesting thought, which is that what would be the redress right now? Like as it currently exists, which is always how I try to frame this conversation around it. Like if you're an indigenous community and you've got a specific issue with a piece of, you know, a traditional design or a sort of a sacred symbol that's then being utilized by somebody else, what's your redress? Like what can you do to protect it? And what are the shortcomings and what's available to you to try to adequately protect it? And is, are the, the mechanisms currently available consistent with what uh, the UN Declaration says you have to provide? And if they aren't, then what do you have to change? I don't know. There's a lot of, like, there's an interest, if you're interested in intellectual property law, the WIPO, which is kind of the world governing body of intellectual property, they have their own specific working group that's about folklore and traditional knowledge that deals just with that issue of how do we reconcile broader intellectual property structures with traditional knowledge, indigenous traditional knowledge and folklore. And there's some really great, really um, like streamlined papers that sort of have identified how you might want to change things, what might need to change. And um, so there's a lot there that I think you could look into too. I know we're short on time. Yeah, so why don't we? I'll stick around outside the room yeah. after, yeah, yeah.
All night. <laughs> All night. Thank you, Jeff, very much. Thanks. Very Thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By all means. Um, so we have a very small token of our appreciation, and I'm sure that we can all agree that you were so much better than awful. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> we're going to have to unpack that. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean by that, Amanda? In addition to inviting you back in the near future, I also hope that you will all invite Jeff to your parties, because quite clearly I You know it. you want to talk about this at your parties. In addition to learning about Endrip, I also learned <laughs> it sounds that way, doesn't it? I talk to myself, I talk about these things in social, it's not great. It's not great, yeah. Get him out of my office and invite him into your room. I will just sit around for three hours, so yeah. <laughs> um, just a couple quick announcements I wanted to make before um, you all go your merry way this afternoon. Um, on Monday, as you might know, we're having another speaker, um, in fact, two speakers, Maggie Wente and Sinead Charbonneau, who are lawyers with the firm Ulthius Peer Townsend are coming to talk about child welfare practices in mm. First Nations after the Caring Society decision. So again, another topic that yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot of recent things happening. So that's in the same room at 1230 on Monday. Um, in On November the 20th, there was a date change. Uh, the final speaker of this semester is Caitlin Tolley, who is an amazing First Nations mm -hmm. advocate and leader, and she's going to come talk about um, her path to law school and what she's doing now with the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, I also have a new series, a uh, speaking series that I'm really excited to share with you. It's um, more of an Indigenous law and traditional teachings um, series that won't take place in this classroom setting. It's going to be in the Rowell Room, which is in Corbell House, where we'll sit in circle and learn from traditional teachers about the grandfather and grandmother teachings as a way, to, a different way to think about um, in practicing Canadian colonial law. So that is um, November 11th is the first day that we have for that, and Grandmother Pauline Kurt is going to be joining us for our first teaching. And then on November the 21st, it confirms that elders Dan and Mary Lou Smoke are going to be coming in from um, London to teach us again in the Royal Room. And um, next semester, uh, we're hoping to do, I'm hoping to be, we, the Indigenous <laughs> Initiative, uh, all of my personality. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it.